The Mike Trevisano Show. Guaranteed to increase listening length and stamina. WTAM 1100. Good afternoon, Cleveland. This is Congressman Dennis Kucinich. I'm here with uh, co-host Elizabeth Kucinich. We're pinch hitting for Mike Trevisano. Thanks, Trev, and hope you and your family have a great Thanksgiving. We have a lot to be thankful for in the Cleveland area, and we're all thankful for Mike Trevisano. In the last hour, we've been talking with Dr. Caldwell Esselton from Cleveland Clinic about the connection between heart disease and diet. Uh, and the, the hour before that, Dr. Colin Campbell, author of the China study and his experience in research uh, dealing with uh, diet, nutrition, and health. In this hour, uh, we are honored with the presence of Dr. Neil Barnard. Uh, he is the uh, head of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He's an author. He's written extensively about diet and nutrition, books, uh, Food for Life, The Power of Your Plate, a Physician's Slimming Guide, Live Longer, uh, Live Better, and he is an expert on uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, Dr. Uh, Neil Barnard, uh, as a way of disclosure, is also the boss of uh, my wife, Elizabeth Kucinich, who is the Government Affairs Director for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in Washington, D.C., and we're proud to, uh, to have him with us this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Barnard, are you there? Yes, I am. It's a great pleasure to, to hear your voice and great to talk with you. Uh, your uh, background in uh, doing research on and uh, work with patients who have experienced type 2 diabetes is very important. Could you share uh, with this important listening audience, uh, people who may have family members who are affected by type 2 diabetes, uh, what you found out in your research and in your practice? Yes, it's, it's really turned medical practice completely on its head. When I, when I was in medical school here in Washington, D.C., I went to the George Washington University, and the whole idea was we knew diabetes was a bad disease. We knew that it was a leading cause of blindness and amputations, and we took it very seriously, but, but the idea was if there's too much sugar in your blood, then it must be that it's coming from eating too much rice or too many potatoes and too much bread and that kind of thing. And so that was the whole approach. And when we used that kind of diet, we didn't get very far, and we needed to really rely on medications that just increased week by week by week. Uh, what our research team did, starting in 2003, we were funded by NIH to try a plant-based diet for diabetes. And the whole theory was, even though it's high in carbohydrate, we were allowing people to eat starchy vegetables and so forth, it was based on the idea that when you look around the world, the people who are the thinnest and have the least diabetes are people for whom those are their staples. They're eating rice in Japan and China, and they're thin, and they don't have much diabetes. So to make a long story short, that's what we did. The diet worked wonderfully. It worked about three times better than a typical diabetes diet, and I think it's really revolutionized the dietary approach to type 2 diabetes in, in this country. And did you, did you always follow a healthy diet? <laughs> oh, my God. I, I wish I could say I did. I, I have to say I, I grew up in North Dakota, uh, Fargo. I don't know if you've seen the movie, but that's where I grew up. And my uh, grandparents were in the cattle business, and so were their, grandpa their parents and their parents. And my father grew up on a cattle ranch, but he didn't like it, and he, he left and went to medical school. And he spent his, his life treating diabetes in Fargo. What did you, when did you first start to get interested in uh, diabetes and its relationship to uh to what people ate? It was really not until uh, working here in Washington I was approached by a diabetes foundation. And they were a little bit concerned that they were spending an awful lot of money on research and trying to find better drugs, but they weren't really getting at the cause. And so they approached me and asked if I would help them to work on a more preventive approach, and that meant diet. But uh, we, at, that, at, that, at that time, we really didn't have a lot of research showing that a plant-based diet would really be that effective. It hadn't been tested very much, and, and so that's how we jumped in. Uh, this is uh, Dennis Kucinich. I'm substituting, uh, along with Elizabeth Kucinich, for Mike Trevisano and WTM 1100. The number is 216-578-1100, 216-578-1100. Dr. Neil Barnard's on the phone. He's someone who uh, knows about type 2 diabetes uh, and the relationship between that and diet. And is, it, is this uh, reversible with diet? It is, it, yes, it is. And, in fact, it used to always be said, once you have diabetes, you're always going to have diabetes. And, and for anybody who's, who's in the listening audience right now or somebody who's driving and you've got diabetes, you probably had the image when, when you got that diagnosis 
that this is a one-way street and there's not a thing that you can do to turn it around. You, you're just going to have to take more and more medications. But let, let me give you an example. There was a man who came into our research study. His name was Vance. And his father, he told me, his father was dead by age 30. Vance was 31 when he was diagnosed with diabetes. He was in his late 30s when he came in to see us. We put him on a, on a plant-based diet, and we kept the oils really low. Dr. Esselstyn would have been proud. <laughs> um, Vance said, this is easy. You know, I'm eating vegetarian chili, and I can eat a bean burrito <clears throat> and spaghetti with chunky tomatoes and wild mushrooms. And we, He didn't find it difficult. But what was surprising is he started losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. After a year, he lost 60 pounds. His numbers came into the normal range. By that, I mean his blood sugar was absolutely normal. And if he had walked into any clinic in America, they would not have been able to diagnose that he had ever had diabetes. So the point being here is that diabetes can be a two-way street. And everybody who's listening to this program now, I want us to think more broadly about it. That, that does not mean that you should fire your doctor. You should absolutely work with your doctor. It does not mean throwing your pills away or your injections. But what it does mean is let's make some bigger dietary changes. Let's see what we can do because there are people who can reduce their medicines. There are people who can come off their medicines in some cases, work with your doctor to make that happen. And there are people for whom this disease will disappear. Neil, this is Elizabeth. Um, could you explain just what that diet would encompass? You know, you're talking about how your diet was, was so much more effective than other diabetes diets. Yeah, well, it's, it's because when you look inside the cells of the body, we find what's going wrong with diabetes. This, the muscle cells in particular, that's where the glucose, the blood glucose that's building up, it's trying to get into the muscle cells, but the muscle cells we have recently learned are filled with fat little droplets of fat inside the muscle cells. Now, I'm not talking about fat under your belt or fat on your hips. or anything. I'm talking about fat inside the muscle cells, even in a, uh, an otherwise thin person. So the diet is designed to drain that fat away. And so, let's be specific. What kind of foods are we talking about here? Uh, four groups, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans. Uh, the bean group is beans, peas, lentils. But we're taking out the meat. There's no meat at all, not chicken, not fish, nothing. We keep the dairy products out of the diet. Mm -hmm. Eggs are gone. And for all those people who are kind of taking that bottle of olive oil and going glug, 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 glug all over their salad, we keep oils to a minimum. And what that does is that tends to, if I can put it this way, drain the fat from the cells. That then allows your natural insulin to start working again. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn uh, is here. He's wanted to uh, make a comment. Go ahead. Hi, hi Neil. Yes, hi, Dr. Esselstyn. Uh, just wanted to reinforce exactly what you've been, been saying because, uh, you know, it's, I've always been, it's always struck me how almost identical uh, your diet is for diabetes and our diet is for heart disease because uh, so many of our patients are diabetic. And one of the things we have to alert them to when they really start doing this intensively, as you've noticed, is that you've got to watch your drugs, watch your medication, because very rapidly your morning blood sugars are going to start to plummet as you come back down to a normal range. Uh, Which is a good thing. <laughs> Joe, yeah. uh, Joe has a comment for Dr. Uh, Barnard. Uh, Joe. Well, I, so, I owned a, uh, a Curves franchise in Lakewood. Yes. And I don't know if you're familiar with the program, but we've helped countless women actually throw away their diabetes medication. Oh, fantastic. Because you're probably getting people not only on a healthier diet, but you're getting them physically moving again, right? Well, not only aerobically, but also with strength training. So a combination of strength training, aerobics, and proper diet. And we literally have had women come back to us, you know, after, you know, a couple of months, and their doctors are amazed that they don't need their medication anymore. You know, that's such a wonderful thing, because part of what we're talking about but the other part is psychological. We need to change our mindset and realize that you really can regain your health, but it, but it means going further than what people had thought to do before. I know when people see Dr. Esselstyn, they'll say, well, all I've got to do is start eating chicken breast and salmon and yogurt, and maybe I'll be fine. And then Dr. Esselstyn <laughs> gives them the news they've got to go a couple steps further. But the payoff is that that heart attack just doesn't occur. and Or the doctor says, you don't have detectable diabetes anymore. It's, it's the greatest gift you could have. You know, we have Mike has been hanging on, uh, on the line here uh, from Solon. Mike, are you still with us? Hey, Dennis, I used to intern for you. How are you doing? Okay, do you have a comment uh, yeah, to either I the wanted, doctors? I wanted everybody to know that there's actually one a vending machine company that can offer that organic 
um, snacks for help for schools and hospitals all over the place. It's a essentially organic vending. Are you familiar with this? Uh, I don't know anything about that. I, I seldom buy food out of vending machines. Oh, but I just want everybody to know that your kids do have good options out there if they want to get well, into that. You know, that, that's, I mean, that's, that, that's very interesting, and I think that, uh, you know, it's good to know that there, in, in various industries there's a progression of people trying to give, uh, provide healthier choices. The closest I come to vending machines is at the West Side Market uh, in the various stalls there. Uh, I, this, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is such a great panel. We've had, I've, had, I've watched uh, Dr. Esselstyn speak at, on YouTube and I think, I think at Whole Foods, too at the Cedar Center store. So thank you very much for Well, thank you so much for together this panel. Thank you Great. so much for calling. Yeah. And let's uh, let's try another caller here. We've got uh, Anthony from uh, Cleveland Heights. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I got a question for you. I'm a type 1 diabetic and I'm uh, 5 510 about 175 pounds and um, I'm 47 years old and it seems like when my blood sugars are like in the 200s um, if I take a tablespoon of olive oil, it seems like my within like a half hour, my blood sugar comes down to like a normal level. And I was wondering if you ever did any research on that. I'll hang up and listen, all right? Dr. Barner. Okay, sure. Uh, well, thank you for your a, a couple of quick points. Uh, the, the dietary recommendations we have for a person with type 1 are the same as for a person with type 2, but there are some major differences here. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with these words, type 1 is used to be called childhood onset. The body isn't making insulin at all anymore in, that, in this case because the cells that make insulin have been killed off by the disease. So you, you need to have uh, insulin injections. There's no way we can stop that with type 1 diabetes. However, the reason that we use the same diet is the number one risk that a person runs when they've got type 1 diabetes is heart disease. So that's the, the kind of person who wants to look at Dr. Esselstyn and say, give me the very best that you've got, because the disease attacks the blood vessels to the heart, the blood vessels to the brain, the blood vessels to the legs, to the kidneys, and so forth. So we don't want any cholesterol in the diet at all. We want to keep fat very, very low. Well, just one last tip. You said if your blood sugars are running up, and you'll have to have some olive oil, and that brings them down a little bit. Here's another approach. Instead of avoiding carbohydrate, which is what you're doing by having oil, Choose the healthier carbohydrates, and that means instead of white bread, go to rye bread or pumpernickel bread. Instead of a big white baking potato, go to yams or sweet potatoes. Instead of uh, cold cereals, the, the, the kid-type cereals, I don't know if you're eating those, but don't eat them, especially if there's a toy inside. Um, go to oatmeal or bran cereal instead. Put some soy milk or almond milk on it. Those are the, the better carbohydrates, and you'll find that your blood sugar starts coming down there. Okay, well, we're going to uh, t take another call here. We're going to go to uh, Pat and Gates Mills. Pat, do you have a question or a comment for Dr. Barnard? Yeah, it's going to, it's going to make me cry. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn saved my life. And uh, he's saving my girlfriend's life. And I think that everybody should go out and get his book. It changed their whole life around. And the two greatest assets, really, that Cleveland has is, uh, is Codwell and, and yourself. I think it's 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 something. That, I mean, the, the, the two of you have gotten together. How did you know what? How did t tell us something? Uh, you said that Dr. Esselstyn saved your life. Do you want to tell the listeners how that happened? It's it's hard, hard to explain. He 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 knows me, but I, I, he probably doesn't know. Did you me. change your diet? Yeah, I changed my diet, and you know, I'm on a strict diet. But I met first met him out of Heinen's and in Chardon. But uh, uh, and the man is the greatest asset that this country has. And I just the question I want to ask him is that you know everybody loves olive oil, and I mean I want to ask him a lot of questions. I'll talk. Okay, to well, him let's now. ask one question. Go ahead. Okay, but but the, here's the here's the thing. A lot of people love olive oil. They cook with that you know the high fried olive oil. You know that the, you can use it to cook high, you know high temperature. Here's here's what I'm having a hard time with. If you squeeze a lemon, you get a juice. If you squeeze the cranberry, you get a juice. But if you squeeze olives, you get an oil. Where is the difference between, can you define the difference between the oil and the juice? Hi, Pat. Dr. Esselstyn, I want to say thank you for your, for your kind comments. Yeah, the difference between the lemon, the lemon juice isn't going to injure the endothelial cells. 
that hasn't that has not been shown to be injurious to the uh, the lining of the artery. But uh, all the studies on olive oil that have been carefully done with the brachial artery tourniquet test clearly show that when min- within minutes of eating the olive oil, uh, you begin to injure those delicate lining cells that are the absolutely the guardian and life jacket of our blood vessels. Yeah. Is it because of so much fat? Yeah, uh, it's yes. It seems to be because of that. Remember now, olive oil is what? It's nothing but total fat. 17% maybe or 14% of saturated fat. The rest is monounsaturated fat, both of which will injure the endothelial lining. It's like, like, like tahini. Yep. Let, let's, uh, let's go to uh, Michael on the east side. A uh, question about a plant-based diet. I, I have a question with regards to the olive oil now. You read a lot of studies over the years that said that olive oil is the best oil, and if you're going to use olive oil, use olive oil. And you guys are, are now recommending not using olive oil. A, a, a simple question. I'm 45 years old. I'm 5'9". I'm 152 pounds. I eat what I want, when I want, how I want. I come from a family of heart problems, diabetes, and I think a lot of it is moderation. One thing we're missing in this country is moderation. We, we, we supersize everything in this country, and I think if... If you eat what you want in moderation and stay on the healthier side, but still don't deprive yourself, because anybody that goes on a diet and deprives themselves three years, five years, six years later, or whatever, they're bored and they go right back to it. It's a lifestyle of eating, it's eating smart and eating smaller quantities. Well, what, you know, this what, is you raise a, you raise an interesting point here, and uh, Dr. Barnard, what about that? If somebody takes these various foods in moderation, uh, why not? Well, I think it's a terrific point, and it's one that many people are thinking of. But when we say all things in moderation, that really refers to good things. So your seven-year-old daughter loves to play the violin. She's playing it all day, all night. You say, wait a minute, everything in moderation, you've got to study. You should exercise. But if somebody is thinking about cocaine or heroin or something harmful to them, is it moderation? No. These are things you don't have at all. Cigarettes? No. So... um, the, the idea of things in moderation means good things for you. Now, it, well, What about the oils he's talking about? Okay. Um, when you, if you reduce the amount of oil you're, you're eating, you're making a good step. But when you, when you get to no added oils, that's best of all. So think of it this way. This is not a zero oil diet in the sense that even a bean or a vegetable or a fruit has a little bit of natural oil in it. Um, and that's what the body actually needs. Where we run into trouble is when we take 10,000 olives and we squeeze out all that oil and put it in a bottle and label it virgin. This is really something that nature never really had in mind. Now, but, but the caller, I think he's right. He says that people do feel deprived. For the first couple of days, you do feel like this is, this is a different way to go. And the way you have to go right now is to a traffic break with Jennifer Rose. Uh, we'll be back with Dr. Neil Barnard and your questions. Hang on the line. Mike Trivisano. A certified professional at an affordable price. News Radio WTAM 1100. Good afternoon, Cleveland. This is Congressman Dennis Kucinich with Elizabeth Kucinich. We're filling in for Mike Trivisano. It's really not possible to replace Trivisano, uh, but it is an honor to be here in his studio, in his lair, where he... uh, causes uh, great things to happen. Matter of fact, I want to remind you that it was Mike Trevisano's show that was responsible for 44 members of Congress signing onto a letter saying to a president's health care task force, make sure that you continue uh, providing a, a test for prostate cancer to healthy men. And that was Mike Trevisano's show was the genesis for that movement among the members of Congress. So thank you, Mike. Uh, this show matters, and today it matters to talk about health and health care and the relationship between diet and nutrition. We have uh, Dr. Neil Barnard on the line. He's the uh, head of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, uh, talking about the connection between the choices that we make and the health outcomes that we have. Uh, Also in the studio is Dr. Caldwell Esselton. In the next hour, uh, after we go around at 6 o'clock, we'll have a panel and take more of your questions. I, one of the things that, Do, Dr. Barner, one of the things that I'm listening to all this discussion, people have to be driving around thinking, well, you're telling me what not to eat. 
Come on, you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> You're telling me what not to eat. What, what about the choices people can make that are good choices that can provide real satisfaction for food and that can also be healthy choices? Can, you, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you know, it really is true. Um, the, the very last recipe, and I have a new book, which if you don't mind, I'll just mention. It's the 21-Day Weight Loss Kickstart, where a person follows a healthy diet for 21 days, and it's a way of kind of getting out of your whatever rut you're in. But the very last recipe is a chocolate cake chocolate cake. And, and people would say, how can you have chocolate cake and make it healthy? The way we do it is we don't stick in a whole stick of butter and eggs and so forth where the cholesterol are. Uh, what we do instead is we use a little bit of applesauce as a binder, and it disappears in the oven. And it comes out as this light, wonderful cake. So if you're looking for a dessert for your Thanksgiving menu or any time, I've got the world's greatest chocolate cake. Well, where do they get? Is there a website they can go to for information oh, well, on well, this? Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, the 21-Day Weight Loss Kickstart, it's, it's at PCRM's website, which is pcrm.org. But it's also on Amazon, and frankly, it's at the, the bookstores and the Whole Foods in uh, the whole Cleveland area. They, they, the last time I was there, they were stocked full of the 21-Day Weight Loss Kickstart. They also have Dr. Esselstyn's book, which uh, I hope you'll pick up as well. But I, I, you know, I want to go back. Elizabeth, you were talking about this during a break. I mean, we, we should you know, share with people the choices that they can make that might be pretty appetizing. Yeah, I think as well, you know, people are thinking when they hear the word diet, it sounds like you can't eat as much food and you've got to restrict yourself. And something that I absolutely love, you know, being someone who wants to be able to fit in her suits that she bought a long time ago, is to be able to eat as much as I want, to feel really full and really nourished and not to put on weight. And so um, maybe, Dr. Um, Barnard, you could talk about um, maybe the difference between the conventional diabetes diet and then what, what you're proposing. Yeah, you know, it's funny. When people come in to see us and we say, here's what you can eat on the diet that we're talking about. We'll say, start for breakfast. Would you like some blueberry pancakes? I'll say, sure, but I'm not allowed to have them because I've got diabetes. We're going to say, wait a minute, you can, you can have blueberry pancakes. And if you want to have a half a melon or a whole melon with it or cantaloupe, that's fine. And then when snack time comes and they're saying, well, I can't have fruit because I've got diabetes. We say, you, you can have, you could eat the whole produce department if you wanted to. It's perfectly, don't, don't take me too literally, but you can eat as much basically as you, as you want to. Uh, and then for dinner, let's say they're having spaghetti. They're going to say, well, I haven't had spaghetti since I was diagnosed with diabetes. What, what we're really concerned about is not the spaghetti. We're concerned more about what you're putting on top of it. So I have a spaghetti sauce that's made with artichokes and seared oyster mushrooms and chunky tomatoes and a little bit of spice, and it's just terrific. And what we have discovered is people are really living again because they're not counting calories. They're not saying they can't have carbs. We're going to have the good carbohydrate. But they're eating a broad range of foods that they thought were off limits. And best of all, just, just as you were saying, Elizabeth, we're, we're not telling them to go away hungry. They can eat until they're full and satisfied. So, so what kind of carbohydrates can people eat? Because I'm sure they couldn't maybe go out to uh, IHOP and eat a big load of blueberry pancakes from there. What, what kind of pancakes would they be eating? Well, it, it's useful to make, to make some good choices. We're, we're, for example, we'll use whole grain flour or buckwheat flour, which is very good. Although for a lot of people that's very familiar. It's just that, that they didn't realize that it's perfectly okay to do it. Now, when it gets to the sausage, I'm going to say instead of the meaty sausage, have the veggie sausage, which they have really come alive in the past uh, several years with some just terrific choices that are, that are really very, very satisfying. If you're at the taco restaurant, and that's where you always go, instead of the meat taco, have the bean burrito, hold the cheese, but if you, you can also fill it with lettuce and tomatoes and jalapeno peppers, and that's fine. And if you're at the submarine sandwich place, when they say to you, what kind of meat do you want to put on, say, wait, hold that, I don't want that. When, instead, what I want is, give me a foot long with whole grain bread, give me the lettuce and the tomatoes and the cucumbers and the spinach and the olives and so forth, and they'll put a little red wine vinegar on top, and they'll toast it for you, and they wrap it up, and it's just delicious. So. This is the one way of eating where nobody ever feels deprived. We got the phones are lighting up here. Jim and Medina, you have a question for Dr. Barnard. Uh, yes, thank you, doctor. I have a question concerning when you switch your diet, how soon can you see the results? And will those results also show in neuropathy and an improvement? Oh, you know, I'm so glad you asked about that. First, first, the first question, um, how soon do you see results? Be prepared for results within the first couple of days. And the reason I say that 
as Representative Kucinich was mentioning a little bit ago, that sometimes people discover that right away, within the first few days, their blood sugar starts to come down. Um, and that is, that's really true. Uh, you may discover your blood sugar coming down within the first couple of days, so make sure your doctor knows that you're improving your diet because your doctor may need to start reducing your medicines as you're getting healthier. But neuropathy, which you're asking about, that's pain in the legs as the nerves are attacked. In the past, we thought there was nothing you could do about that. But in our first diabetes study, we had a man who had had neuropathy for years. It totally remitted. Uh, it took him maybe about four months on this diet, but the neuropathy, neuropathy was completely gone. That He was completely pain-free. And we have now seen that with many people. So by all means, give it a shot. Um, don't fire your doctor. Do continue to see your doctor, work with your doctor, but give the diet a shot and see if you can't get rid of those symptoms. Okay, uh, Jim, or Gary and Berea, rather. Hello? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, Dennis? Yes. Hello? Yeah, you, you, you're on the air, and uh, do you have a question for Dr. Barnard? Yeah, uh, one, one comment. Uh, have you heard of uh, Gardenia food for regulating uh, diabetes type for I'm sorry, I, I missed the word. Have you heard of gardenia fruit? G -R -D -A. No, no, okay, that's you a might new one want for me. To Google it. Yeah, I, I've uh, I had type two diabetes, and uh, when I gardenia fruit, you get it from your Chinese herbal uh, person. Very inexpensive. You make tea out of it. Uh, when I after I drank a cup of it, my <laughs> blood sugar dropped about thirty points immediately. And then, you know, once I'm on it, it's my pancreas was regulating my blood sugar normally. The other question is, uh, that was a comment, I have a question which deals with um, determining, is it, could, can we make he headway and in inroads into uh, solving the problems of cancer if we had better methods and technologies for detecting it at stage one? And the reason why I ask this is because there appears to be some unorthodox methods out there, in particular research studies that have been done in Sweden, Germany, uh, at a foundation out in California using uh, specialty scent detection dogs to detect the presence of cancer at stage one. And uh, would that not be, be helpful? I mean, yeah. I, I, Gary, I think, you're, I think you're on to something. The sooner you can just answer, the better off you are. Having said that, I want to back up a step before that, and that is we need to do a whole lot more, A, to prevent cancer, which we really can do with some diet changes and some other changes, but also to use dietary interventions after cancer has occurred. And the reason I say that is we now know that foods can affect hormones in a positive way, the very hormones that would otherwise drive breast cancer. Diet changes can put the brakes on those hormones. They can also affect uh, the, the factors that would otherwise increase the risk of colon cancer. So we should be putting the f foods to work as well. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. We're going to go to traffic break right now with Jennifer Rose. The Mike Trevisano Show. Creating a better tomorrow today. WTAM 1100. The Mike Trevisano Show, and this is Dennis Kucinich. I am honored to be co-hosting this show today with Elizabeth Kucinich. We're pinch hitting for Mike Trevisano. And Cleveland, we, we have uh, some of the most renowned physicians who are taking the practice of medicine in the direction to the whole person and linking diet, nutrition, and health in a way that uh, is helping this country and will help people all over the world. We have Dr. Colin Campbell, who was on our first hour, the author of the China Study, uh, along with his son, uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn of Cleveland Clinic, who's done uh, uh, path-breaking work in the area of diet, nutrition, and health care, specifically with respect to cardiovascular health, and Dr. Neil Barnard of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, who's written many books and uh, has a strong uh, uh, practical knowledge of the effects of diet uh, directly affect, uh, affected uh, uh, various uh, 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 diseases and how you can move from disease to health uh, and reverse conditions. Uh, these uh, uh, physicians and researchers are individuals who uh, we're privileged to have, uh, and, I, and I'm so glad I've had an opportunity to work with Elizabeth to bring uh, them to this important audience. 
Uh, we have almost another hour left in the time. Uh, in the next few minutes, we're going to be talking to Dr. Barnard, taking some more calls. And for the last hour, we're going to have a panel, again, with Dr. Esselstyn, Campbell, and uh, Barnard to take your calls. Uh, but right now, let's go back to the phone, and let's uh, talk to um, Don in Euclid. Don, go ahead. Uh, you have a question for Hi, Dr. Barnard. Yes. No, I have a question for Dr. Esselstyn. I'm a patient of his. I met him in 2005 after having bypass surgery at the age of 50, and I was honored to be his himself and his wife. And my question more relates to, as I've been listening to the program, where I myself had an incentive to follow his program because I didn't want to do bypass surgery again anytime soon. But when you have this broad audience today, how do you get through? I mean, I grew up in an Italian family. I had to give up a lot of food, and I have. But now how do you approach the general public who's not thinking about that heart attack, bypass surgery? How do you really get it across to uh, make it clear to them that these foods really, in many ways, are not good for you outside of all the weight you lose and how good you feel? Doctor. Well, I think that's an, an ex- excellent uh, point because what it really always comes down to uh, in these situations is education. And obviously you're correct that the people who have already, already had a shot across the bow, who have already had uh, an inkling that they have this illness or disease, are much more likely to be attentive and be uh, able to listen and to hear. Uh, but what we mentioned earlier is that uh, I think we know now, that I think we can tell probably the, the great majority of Americans out there if we know from autopsy studies that are done on people who die in this country of accidents, homicides, and suicides between the ages of 17 and 34, if we're able to tell that all those people already have a, a foundation of heart disease, then really this message is, is for everybody. And, uh, you know, when, I, when you think about the diet that they, we, we might say is extreme, I think that the extreme diet is the one that's caused this, the epidemic of heart disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, and, and hypertension. And uh, it's really quite exciting when we su- see that the people who apply this type of plant-based nutrition and able are to, to reverse their diseases is quite striking. I think the thing that makes it so interesting for Dr. Not Barnard and Dr. Campbell and myself is that right now we really feel that America could, could possibly be on the cusp of what we really consider to be a seismic revolution in health. And that revolution is never going to come about from the invention of another pill. It's never going to come about from the invention of another procedure. It's never going to come about from the invention of another operation. That seismic revolution in health can come about when we really show the public the degree of nutritional literacy so that they can eat foods that are going to enhance their health, that are delicious, and not foods that are going to injure them. Elizabeth? Yeah, I know. I just want to reiterate that you know we're not telling people what they should and shouldn't be eating, but this really is about um, informing people. And you know, when I changed to a plant-based diet, I was absolutely amazed when I just went to the supermarket and really looked around, and I filled up my shopping cart and I went home and was able to cook amazing food. And when I go out to restaurants, there's always options available. And even if you go to a steakhouse that doesn't have anything written on the menu, I have found some of the best vegan food cooked by um, steakhouse chefs when I just say look I don't eat any any uh, animal products they can really rustle up extraordinary food and uh, we had a question here from our wonderful traffic girl and she was saying well what about ice cream can, can I eat ice cream I love ice cream I love <laughs> ice cream oh my goodness <laughs> and, and what do you do for milk and now Dennis lives on coconut milk um, I mm-hmm. prefer rice milk and soy milk and when it comes to ice cream there's the most an amazing ice cream which is made from coconut milk and it's sweetened with agave so it doesn't spike your blood sugar and it's more creamy than any real cream could be. I will have, I will have to so try there, it. So there are choices that, that you can make and they, they're choice you can make joyously. Let's hear from Rob in Avon Lake here. Uh, Rob, you have a question for Dr. Barnard. Uh, yeah, first I want to say um, I, I'm so glad that this uh, made the air. Um, I, I read his, Dr. Eskel, and actually I read his book two years ago and I've been on his diet and the the comment I have about it is it's it's easy if you're in your house and you're 
you know, easy, but it's easier if you're in your house doing this diet. It's when you go out of the house and you go to a social event or a family function, even the restaurants, and I just talked about that. But that's really the, the key, and I just find it so hard to believe that the restaurants aren't catching on. I ask for black bean burgers, veggie burgers at so many restaurants, and they don't even have them offered on the menu. So I'm hoping that... Um, and I believe this Obama change, uh, Obama health care change is helping with that, and I hope that that keeps going through on as far as that goes. I, I don't know about that, but let me ask Dr. Esselton to respond because we're going to have to go to a break soon. Go ahead. Well, I'm with you. I certainly hope that there, there will be a, a, a new era coming. But, you know, you're going to find more and more that you're gonna, there are spots that you can go and get something. Right now, even in the Cleveland airport, there's a little spot that we found that absolutely can give me a... a, a a wrap that is absolutely filled with wonderful vegetables. Stay tuned. We've got another hour of uh, with our panel, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Esselstyn, and Dr. Neil Barner to PCRM. I'm Dennis Kucinich here with Elizabeth Kucinich. We're pinch hitting for Mike Trevisano here at WTAM 1100-216-578-1100. Uh, have fun this afternoon, Cleveland. <laughs>